Christ, the one who was, and is, and is to come, welcomes you to this place. As one body, with one voice, we honor and glorify the giver of wisdom, the giver of truth, the giver of life, the giver of peace. Would you join me in singing number 478? constantly abiding.
and then the chorus.
They had settled there, and, and most had not returned to the Promised Land in 538, when King Cyrus gave the Jews permission to go home. One of those Jewish men from an exiled family in Babylon, his name was Mordecai. Mordecai was working <coughs> for the Persian king as one of his gatekeepers, a security guard at King Xerxes' palace. Mordecai was a devout Jew. Everywhere the king or Haman, the vice president, went, people bowed down to them as they passed by. Haman really loved that. It made him feel so good about himself, about his life. But Mordecai would bow to no one but God. Kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This riled Haman. Every day when Haman was coming and going from work, he would pass by Mordecai. And Mordecai never saluted him. Never bowed to Haman nor the king. When Haman one day discovered that Mordecai, the security guard, was one of those hated Jews. He began plotting how he might kill Mordecai for publicly dishonoring him. So Haman and his friends cast lots, or, or they, they threw dice, to decide which month they should have a genocide of the Jews. Because Haman thought to himself, why sh kill one Jew when I now have the authority and power to get rid of them all? So he and his friends cast lots. The Hebrew word for lot is pur. If you pluralize it, it's purim. So they cast their purim. And the Purim chose the 12th month, the 13th day, to slaughter all the Jews. This gave Haman 11 months in which to hatch his evil plot. One day Haman reports to King Xerxes that there's one particular ethnic group in our empire. He doesn't name them. But they just don't fit in. They are so different that they refuse to live by our laws. They're a bunch of troublemakers, dear king. And Haman rec recommended their annihilation. Now, King Xerxes, he trusts Haman. And so he gives Haman permission to get rid of the troublemakers, whoever they are, from all 127 provinces of the Persian Empire all the way from India to Macedonia, Libya to Iran, and everywhere in between, including the Holy Land, which was one of those 127 provinces of the Persian Empire. So Haman wrote up a law and got the king's consent, giving everyone in the empire permission to kill their Jewish neighbors on the 13th day of the 12th month. And in doing so, they could claim all their Jewish neighbors' property and possessions for themselves. If Haman is successful in this plot, there will be no Jews left on the planet. There will be no Jews to welcome a baby Jesus. There will be no Jews to reestablish the nation of Israel in the Middle East in our generation. It would be the end of the story. By the way, just a side note. I read somewhere a few years ago that, that Hitler thought a lot of this man, Haman, and thought he should be honored today with 
holidays and feasts. One of the great men of history, according to Hitler. Where were we? When the Jews learned of this plot, they became very afraid. So they fasted and prayed for God to deliver them. Now, we have to understand that King Xerxes did not know that his wife, Hadassah, the queen, was a Jew. He did not know that Mordecai, his gatekeeper, was a Jew. When Mordecai found out about Haman's plot, he asked his adopted daughter, Queen Esther, that's her Persian name, Hadassah was her Hebrew name. He asked Esther to beg the king for mercy on behalf of their people, the Jews. Now, entering the king's presence without an invitation, without an appointment, was against the law. <clears throat> Which sometimes carried the death penalty. Now, I understand the reason for the law. is to protect the king from assassins and terrorists who might break into his presence and kill him. But this law also made it hard for Queen Esther to approach his royal presence. So Esther said that she would take that chance if Mordecai and all the Jews in the capital city of Susa would fast and pray for her for three days, which they did. Then Esther said, here I go. She put her life on the line. She said, if I perish, I perish. If I die, at least I've done what I could. I've done my best for my people. For God's people. Esther was willing to die in order to help the people of God. Would you? What cause would you be willing to die for? Some Ukrainian Canadians are risking their lives by going back home to Ukraine to help defend the homeland. They're willing to die for their people and their homeland. What would you and I dare to die for? Something worth pondering. To make a long story short, the king did receive Esther graciously. And the queen invited the king, along with Haman, to dine with her the next day because she had a favor to well, Haman went home that day, and he called his friends over. And he boasted to his wife and his friends about all the power he now had. And all the privileges he now had, now that he is vice president of the biggest empire in the world. And he bragged how he was the only person invited by the queen to dine with the royal couple the next day. What a feather in his cap. But Haman also complained yet again about how much Mordecai infuriated him. His friends suggested that in order for Haman to be happy, he might not be able to wait till the twelfth month to get rid of Mordecai. He says, you're right. I won't be happy till Mordecai is gone. So Haman built a gallows in the street in front of his own house so that he could watch out the window and see Mordecai hang and be publicly humiliated and shamed and dishonored. Well, at the dinner party the next day, Esther asked the king to spare her life. 
and to spare her people, the Jews, who were facing a slaughter. This came as a surprise to the king. He asked who was threatening her, and she pointed to Haman, who didn't even know that she was a Jew until this moment. The king was furious. So furious, he got up and went out to the garden to walk and think and calm down. Haman is now scared to death. He begs Queen Esther for mercy. As Haman is falling on the couch where the queen is sitting, pleading with her, the king walks back into the room. He misreads the situation. He thinks Haman is putting a move on Queen Esther. Now the king loses it. And he orders Haman to be hanged on the gallows that were just constructed outside his own house. As a result, the king gives Esther all of Haman's property and possessions. For he is a wealthy nobleman. And the queen asked Mordecai to manage this massive estate for her. Not only that, but the king gave Mordecai Haman's old job as the vice president of the great empire of Persia. Since the royal law permitting the genocide of the Jews could not be repealed, the king gave Mordecai the job of passing a new law to allow the Jews to defend themselves if they get attacked on the 13th day of the 12th month. And God empowered his children to defend themselves against every attacker. The day of genocide turned into a day of joy. A day of celebration all the way from India to Ethiopia. Purim will be celebrated by Jews around the world this Thursday, March 17th. It will be the most joyful religious holiday for the Jews. It's a time when they celebrate God's salvation, God's deliverance. It's called Purim because Haman cast lots, Purim, to decide the day and month for the genocide of the Jews. The day before Purim each year, the Jews gather together to listen to the whole book of Esther being read at the synagogue or temple. And then they fast and they pray, as Esther and the Jews of Susa did. And then on the day of Purim, they listened to the whole book of Esther read once again. They also, on Purim, make a charitable donation to help the poor, refugees, the homeless, the unemployed. As part of Purim, they, they make two kinds of food and deliver it to a friend. Because Queen Esther gave a dinner party for two men. And then they gather together as extended families to hold a big feast on the day of Purim, where they sing and dance because God saved his people from annihilation. Not just on this one occasion, but so many times down through history. Some Jews even wear masks or costumes to the Purim party because they say God remained hidden. Throughout this whole orda ordeal with Haman, God worked only behind the scenes. And so they hide themselves. Many of the Purim desserts served at the Purim feast 
have hidden goodness inside them for the same reason. Because God rescued his people without being seen. He sent no angels, no visible angels, no, no what we usually think of miracles occurred, no earthquakes. God's name is not even mentioned in the whole book of Esther. God remained in the shadows. And because of that, some people think Esther, the orphan girl who became queen, is the hero of the story. Some suggest that Mordecai is the one who saved the Jewish people from slaughter. Some even credit King Xerxes for preserving the children of God. But you know, and I know, what Mordecai and Esther knew. That our God is a prayer answering God. Who often works behind the scenes. Who works without being seen. His wonders to perform. People often give credit for saved lives and miracles. They give people credit because they don't see God at work. Often observers call it a coincidence or, or you got lucky or, or, or they offer some scientific explanation. But you and I know God is always at work on behalf of his children who cry out to him in prayer. That's the reason why Esther would not approach her husband unless all the Jews in the city fasted and prayed for her for three days. Because she needed God to be working in the king's heart before she got there. It was God who gave wisdom to Mordecai to enact a new law that would protect the Jews from the planned genocide. And then God gave success to all the Jews in defending their homes on the 13th day of Adar, when the neighbors attacked. I see in this story God's grace. I see God's power. I, got, I see God's hand guiding history. Do you see it too? What can we Christians in Canada learn from Purim? Number one, pride goeth before fall. Haman thought higher of himself than he ought to have. Boasting and bragging sets one up to get shot down. So beware. Secondly, those who bless Israel or the church will be blessed. Those who bless the people of God will themselves be blessed. Those who seek to harm God's people will have to deal with Jehovah, the great I Am, the Lord who is our shield and protector. Thirdly, just because we don't see God working miracles for us in our time of need, do not think that God is not answering our prayers. God loves his children with agape love, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Even when we ourselves have messed up, God continues to defend to provide for, to watch over his children. Right this minute, if you have cried out to the Lord for help, he is working behind the scenes. He's pulling strings. He's moving people around. He's opening doors. He's passing laws. He's using pagan leaders. He's moving mountains. He's providing resources that you didn't even know you would need. All without making a personal appearance. 
without sending visible angels to the rescue. Many people in Ukraine today may be wondering where God is. As you know, someone has been trying to wipe out the Ukrainian people. And the Ukrainian people have been praying. And yet the bombing goes on unabated. Where is God? Is God going to answer their cries for help? Or has God forgotten and forsaken his children in Ukraine? The answer is yes. God always responds to the cries of his children. He never forsakes his people in their time of need. He will not desert any followers of Christ who call out to him today. He sees every orphan, every refugee, every bombed out hospital and kindergarten. How will the Father answer the prayers of the Ukrainian people? How will the Lord answer our prayers on behalf of the suffering people of Ukraine? We don't know yet. But we do know that God is in Ukraine. He's in every overflowing refugee camp. And he is working behind the scenes. He's providing resources. The Heavenly Father has a plan, his own plan, and it is unfolding in his time. Let's have faith. You know, God didn't show himself in the valley of Elah either, back when David was facing off against Goliath. God never made an appearance, but have no doubt, Jehovah was there. God didn't show his face in the valley of Jezreel when Gideon's 300 men faced an enormous army of Midianites and Amalekites. But it was God who won that battle, hands down. And when you and I look back over our lives, we can see now what we couldn't see then. That God was in our corner every time we went through a trial. Even though we couldn't see him, we might not have even felt his presence. But now, looking back, we see that his hand was on us. We see that his spirit was with us. He was in control. He had a plan that we could not see at the time. But we needn't have worried and fretted as we did. Because our God is a faithful good shepherd in the good times and in the battles of life. All we need to do is trust him. All we need to do is believe. All we need to do is to listen and to obey his whispers. For the Lord our God is with us. Just as he was with Mordecai and Esther. Your homework for this week. You may want to write this down here in the sanctuary and at home. Here's your homework assignment. Number one. Yes, because there's several parts to this homework assignment. Number one, consider fasting and praying this Wednesday, the day before Purim, along with our Jewish friends. Let's consider fasting and praying. Let's skip at least one meal to pray for our world, to pray for our country, to pray for the body of Christ. Secondly, I would encourage you to read the whole story 
of Esther this week. And marvel once again at God's faithfulness to his children. Our Jewish friends will read it twice. Number three. If you were not able to donate a special gift this morning, I encourage you to help the poor sometime this week, locally or in the Ukraine, as will our Jewish friends. Number four. This Thursday, the day of Purim, I invite you to celebrate God's awesome salvation with much joy. Remembering God's salvation in the Exodus, remembering Jesus' death and resurrection for all mankind, and remembering our own personal salvation. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, who is our life. And finally, for those who are here with me this morning, after the benediction, Tammy has made some Purim cookies for you. Each one with hidden goodness inside a pastry triangle. Supposedly, the shape of these treats remind the Jewish people of Haman's hat. Would you pray with me? Father in glory, we give you praise, we give you honor for all the times that you have rescued us, that you have saved us. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving our sins. Thank you for giving us a new life. Thank you, Lord, for the many times you've got us out of messes of our own doom. Thank you, Lord, for the times you have delivered us when others tried to trip us up. You have been a faithful father, and we give you glory. For all of our friends who are watching at home, we pray, Lord, your blessing, your touch, For those who haven't found the joy of your salvation, we pray, Lord, this might be the day when you deliver them from their bondage, from their sins, through forgiveness and grace, through accepting Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Lord, as we celebrate Purim this week, remind us, remind us, O oh Lord, of where you have brought us from, of what you have brought us through, And who you have made us to be as your children this day. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, and King.